This is a wonderful day. So good to be back. So we're continuing this deep dive on the 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 afterlife and on uh, the Kabbalah of the afterlife. And so I was going through each of the stages of the initial stages of the afterlife. And what I'm up to, I believe, is stage eight. If I've already done stage eight, I apologize. It'll be a good uh, review. And then hopefully we'll start getting into stage nine and 10. So there are a number of logical methods that are available to explain this idea that happens in the process. Remember, this is not linear. It can happen at any point, but after the soul leaves this world, again, I'm using a, a, a modern term. The soul doesn't really leave this world. The soul is just continuing on. So we don't see this as the afterlife. We see this as the continuation of life. That said, there's this idea of ethereal light entities. They, we, we describe them as those who are previously deceased, maybe relatives, friends, people who are known to that particular soul, bathed in light, in light. They're angelic figures. We even said it's possible that God is there. Most probably, well, God is everywhere, so most probably God is there. And it's a kind of life review. Now, if you want to talk about this from a logical perspective, there's a neurophysiological explanation that through the gradual depletion of oxygen, which occurs near death, minor seizures of the temporal lobes may occur. And as a result of those minor seizures, old memories may rematerialize. Actually, according to the peer-reviewed studies, at least the ones that I saw, probing the temporal cortex and stimulating it with a mild electric shock brings to consciousness previously lost, hidden, or I'll even say forgotten memories. In the 1950s, there was a Canadian surgeon who passed a, a mild electric current through electrodes connected to a certain region of the visual cortex. And patients began to remember events and occurrences of the past in detail, as if they were reliving those events with all their sights, with all their sounds, with all their smells. And once the current was shut off, the induced memory was instantly, instantly lost. And every time, according to the study, according to this research, every time that region was once again stimulated, the entire memory came back. And interestingly, it didn't continue from where it left off, but rather it started all over again. It was like, if I can say this, that there was a place in the brain that records incidences as they occur. And you can turn them on and off with the electrodes. This was referred to in the study as the experiential response, a full reenactment of a previously lived experience. Cheryl, please. Were these memories, memories of this lifetime or could they have gone back to previous lifetimes? And was this current something that 
was internal or external from somebody who was trying to do this experiment? According to the study that I saw, it was about memories of this lifetime, not previous lifetimes. Okay. I mean, obviously, I, was, I don't know if, if science is going to start delving into, into previous lifetimes. I think that's more uh, spiritual matters. Okay, thanks. At least from what I've seen. Now, as sensible as this theory may seem, I think there are some loose ends here that don't add up, and I just want to point them out. There are researchers who contend that the images that are conjured up through seizures are generally not known to be arranged in a chronological order. They don't appear in the mind as they appear in the order of life. Now, on the other hand, for those who experienced these images during what we're going to call the near-death experience that we've been speaking of, the order of the events was actually chronological. So that doesn't make any sense to me, at least from my studies. And beyond the physiological, there's also psychological reasons that are offered to explain this phenomenon. One theory that I saw is that in order to help the conscious mind escape the, the horrible reality of death, the mind automatically reverts to and revisits old childhood memories. Again, the issue that this explanation does not make clear is why, why would the mind produce images in the same order that they occurred? If it's a way to deal with the pain, why would being two years old resurface before three years old? So I think the preference should be in the pleasantness of the memory and not its chronological sequence. That the idea behind it from a scientific perspective is that there's a, a pleasantness and there's a calmness in those early childhood memories for most people, for some people it's not. And we we won't get into, in, into trauma right now. But for those people, why those memories are coming back, this is just my interpretation of it and my understanding based on my knowledge of both the science and the spiritual and the Kabbalistic, is that I think that the, 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 the consciousness or the subconsciousness for that matter is trying to conjure up a certain level of pleasantness during this time in order to counteract the extreme process that's happening in the NDE, in the near-death experience. So that's my take on stage eight. I want to go to stage nine and 10. I hope I'll be able to finish it today. If not, we may have to finish it next week. Throughout... Just yes. if I may, Rabbi, please. Uh, is there a relation between psychedelics and what you just mentioned by any chance? I, I, I do think that people who uh, dabble in psychedelics, they could conjure up these experiences without having to have an NDE. Uh, and, and I have heard from those people who have experienced that. And for some people, uh, especially people who suffer from uh, trauma and anxiety, uh, this could actually be comforting. Okay, thank you. Throughout the near-death experience, there seems to be an absence of time and space. Let's talk about time and space for a second. Time and space is unique to our world. It's unique to this world. It's unique to where we are in this dimension. The fact that we are in this world for those of you who are familiar with Kabbalah, the, the, the lower level of Asiya, the lower level of Asiya is the only level that has this level of time and space, this idea that there's time, which means, and, and we've spoken about this idea of where's heaven, right? You can go as high as you want now that we have the ability through, you know, through private and public funds to go to space. You can go as high as you want in space and you're not going to find heaven. Heaven is not up, even though that's what we do physically. Heaven is right here. It's just a different dimension. What is the difference between heaven and our dimension? Time and space. 
So these NDEs that we speak of, there seems to be almost like a heaven-like experience with the absence of time and space. It appears to be operating in a dimensionless reality. Now, the concept of spacelessness, the concept of timelessness, can also be somewhat explained scientifically. And I'm going to try to explain it without resorting to the paranormal. The premise is that once certain regions of the brain begin to deteriorate, once they cease to function properly and perceptions of time and, and space become less pronounced, there are studies that demonstrate a quantifiable phenomena that explain why people who enter deep meditative mindful states or prayer or even deep thinking experience a sense of spacelessness or as they call oceanic boundlessness. This sense can be summed up, I believe, by the great Albert Einstein. He said, as the feeling that, and let me, I'm going to try to get this right, that the, the universe is a single significant whole. Or Schrodinger once wrote, you and all other conscious beings are such, I believe it's you and all other conscious beings as such are all in all. So explaining this, but by, by mapping the brain before and during meditation with EEG, with computer scanning, they portrayed the brain's activity in red and yellow colors. You, you, can, you can see this even online, the way it was done. And the research found that there occurred a, a striking color change in a certain part of the brain during peak moments of meditation, during peak moments of relaxed focus. On the left side of the cerebellum, let me just make sure that's right. I don't know, I don't think it's, I think it's the left side of the cerebrum. Right behind, because I'm thinking, I'm kind of just picturing this in my mind. Right behind the crown of the skull, there's a region of the brain that is called, and Jill, maybe you'll help me with this. I believe it's called the posterior superior partial lobe. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about okay. that anatomy. I believe so. And when a person is in a regular mood of consciousness, this part of the brain shows up on the computer as flaming red. But during peak moments of meditation, this area becomes a deep azure. I think that shows that there's a substantial decline in that region's activity. This is the part of the brain, just so you understand, that helps us orient ourselves in time and space. It gives the body its sense of physical limits. It's precisely this partial lobe, which I'm pretty sure is correct in the anatomy, that helps us locate ourselves in space. For example, what does it do on a regular day? It makes sure that we don't walk into the wall. Now, when there's a substantial decrease in this region's activity, and there's no longer a vital sensory stimuli or stimulus to clearly define the borders between us and the world, the brain perceives and concludes that the self is endless and is truly 
interwoven with everyone and everything. That everything is really still one. You see, the oneness exists in the state. Now, let me tell you my, my opinion on this. It's good. It's good science. It's fascinating. I think that with all the attractiveness of this theory, there's something that still remains un unresolved. And I think that we need to still explore further. The question that can never truly be answered is this. Is the experiential phenomenon of dimensionless being a physical manifestation of a spiritual occurrence? Or is it just a physical phenomenon? which is interpreted as a spiritual event. I'll, I'll clarify. Is the physical experience in the brain the cause of the experience, or is it the effect? Is it simply an external symptom of a spiritual phenomenon, or is the external sensation the source and the generator of the experience itself any thoughts did i lose you no it's such an interesting question how do you yeah. how do you even begin to to make a decision about that this you is know, this is the kind of stuff that i think about yeah no i, People, I love it People often will tell me, oh, I had a spiritual experience. I'm thinking to myself, was it really a spiritual experience? And, and, and I'm not discounting. Let, let me be clear. I'm not discounting that somebody had a, an existential experience or what they call a spiritual experience. That's your, that's your narrative and that's your story and continue telling it to yourself and make sure that it's positive and loving and joyous and, and, and happy birthday. Mm -hmm. But now that we're able to do this deep dive and actually think about these things, and think about from where it comes. So outside of, yes, positive ex experience, do, great, action, loving, wonderful. But now that we have an ability to step back, these are the kind of things that I think about. I was going to say, <laughs> Rabbi, that um, uh, Einstein in meditation, sometimes when you meditate, you reach, you you're so attentive to the moment that at that period of time, everything's infinite. Mm. Or it seems it infinite. Seems, well, yeah, it seems infinite, uh, but uh, in the moment, life is infinite. Like think of, uh, um, it seems, I, I get what you mean by seems, but there's this, Energy is uh, abundant. Yes. Uh, and because it's abundant and everywhere, uh, even if it's a sliver of, you know, the continuation of it, as a mere human being, you know, that is very empowering. And like, it, it feels like you're, you're tiny and the universe is vast. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Maor, I don't want to take away that experience from you or from anyone else, because it's such an important, that's, that's a narrative experience. Right. But what I'm talking about is taking a step back and looking at the overall experience, which means, it, yes, if, if that's the way it seems to you, if it seems existential to you, let it be existential, because we need those moments. They inspire us. They uplift us. Or for those people who, who have those experiences, it really does uplift them. Got it. Yeah. What would be your answer, Rabbi? Well, I, 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 don't worry, I'm getting there. <laughs> but I, I wonder, I mean, you, you pointed to a study, and I've also seen other studies of people meditating while they're getting an MRI, and it changes, the brain changes. For sure. You know, and there, there are people who, uh, what about hypnosis? There are people who are able to put themselves in an hypnotic state and not have to take any sedation during surgery. Right. I mean, that's the power of the mind. But is it just, but, the, you know, we go to the question, is it during meditation, is it just the mind that is 
doing that? Or are we able to connect somewhere, something somewhere else? And I, I don't know how, I don't think we have the tools to measure that yet. <laughs> you don't have the to tools know. to measure that, but you now captured one of my great questions. I, I, this is something that I often think about as someone who dabbles both in the scientific world and in the world of spirituality. I, I yeah. think it's important to for, for us dabblers in both worlds to be able to ask these questions. Yeah, I think they're vital. Yeah. So if we were all in the same state of consciousness at the same state of time and realized that we were all one, would that be the Mashiach? Sounds... Good to me. You can call it uh, Mashiach. You can call it a state of euphoria or bliss, whatever makes you happy. Yes. Well, we need to start doing that one at a time, then two at a time, and now 16 of us at a time. That's right. But ourselves first, that's, that's the main thing. If we can do it ourselves, that would be amazing. So... This is, I don't necessarily think I have uh, an absolute answer, and I don't know if there is an absolute answer, but I'll give you a little more of a of, of an under the hood, so to speak, into the process of my thinking. And I don't want, I, I wasn't, I didn't ask that question for it to be a pointed or directed question. It's still the open question. I don't want to take away the fact that this is an open question. I wasn't trying to set you up for anything with this question. I, you know, I, I really dislike that. So, but I, I do want to, continue and try to give you a little bit of like my thought process and where I've been thinking with this. I think that we can draw a parallel between this and any experience that we have. So let's take an example, an experience of looking at a physical object. If we recognize and we map the brain to see how it works in a particular manner. Moor, have a good day. Thanks for joining us. So if we map the brain to see how it works in a particular manner, when we observe an outside object, this wouldn't deny the fact that there's an external object that's being observed. All we've done is shown what happens to the brain when it's observing. And I think the same example can be used with these mystical types of near-death experiences. It can be argued that all science is really telling us is what happens to the brain when it's going through a mystical experience. Not that the brain activity is the actual cause of the experience. It's just mapping out the experience. What the cause is, is not what science is necessarily worried about or interested in. The problem is, is issues such as these open-ended and unresolved issues as they are, I think it's important for each of us to be left to decide on our own. I don't know if there's ever going to be a one size fits all. I don't know if there's any ever anyone that will be able to come and say, this is the answer. And to some extent, the, in, the individual interpretation or the individual narrative will be based largely on our own predispositions and on our own personal inclinations. My thought is that it's a deeply, deeply subjective matter and it's not objective. Though when it, we're experiencing it or when we're thinking of it, it, we may believe otherwise. So it's an issue that can never really fully be resolved with a consensus among all people. And I think that to the most part, it has to be decided by the individual personally. But overall, I'm not gonna say but overall, and overall, it's difficult to completely dismiss the near-death experience as illusory or uh, a figment 
of the dying person's overactive imagination. There seems to be a profound difference between, let's say, someone who is suffering from schizophrenia and other related psychosis and the near-death experiences. The schizophrenia, for example, is generally negative. It generally has a propensity to bring the person down or to make them feel unrealistically high about themselves. When the near-death experience is more positive, at least from the anecdotes that I've heard. And often they're empowering. The person leaves that experience and wants to do something and, and wants to, says, oh, life is short and wants to do something meaningful with their life all of a sudden. Do you... If I may, if I may add, Rabbi. Sure. Um, I have uh, have been diagnosed in the past with mania. Mm -hmm. And if, if um, it's just so I can share with you guys and it's also you. bring you Thank awareness. You Thank you for sharing. It's it's a pleasure. And in in some parts, there there are pos positive aspects because, like, um, in my personal experience, I came out of it uh, hoping to help out the world. So, oh, so then, guess... so then, so then, that's very good, and I and I appreciate that. Again, it, it, and I and and I I would like to stand corrected then that that so there 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 may be positive experiences, maybe often negative, but there can also be positive. Yes, but you are definitely right. There's a lot of negative and most people are unable to control and interact in the right way with that, whichever uh, space that they're in. So you Thank are completely you. right as well. Thank you so much for that share, Jamil. Really, really uh, honored. It's my pleasure. Thanks to you. So, so then that, so I would say, I'm going to rephrase and say it's mostly negative and also could be positive when it comes to 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 that kind of schizophrenic experience but rather the nde i have never heard at least from my anecdotes and maybe someone will will pipe up and and, and correct me on that as well um that it's ever been a negative experience only a positive one and the the illusory perception causes the person to think either extremely negatively about themselves or extremely positive. For example, there are some people who I've heard think that they're Alexander the Great or, or Napoleon, with the end result being despair and depression. But on the other hand, with a near-death experience, it actually seems to be, for the most part, to have the exact opposite effect. It often inspires the person and makes them a healthier functioning person, a kinder, a nicer person, a more loving person, which is I think a, a very beautiful thing. And I just to finish this off, in addition, in the absolute contrast to the psychotic experience that I was talking about and Jamil was talking about, people who undergo a near-death experience have quite a good handle on life. Most of them are in no way out of touch with reality. I think on the contrary, they observe and report details that may have otherwise been overlooked. And I think these people, unlike the people who suffer from a distorted perception, they seem to operate in a, in a heightened sense of awareness with a, a keen sense of focus perception. I would say, though, on a scientific note, it's also problematic to attribute the near-death experience with a hallucination. Often that happens. People will, will think of it as a hallucination. In order to hallucinate, to, to hallucinate, there needs to be some level of brain activity. And some people have experienced near-death encounters while their brain waves appear to be flat. So within the reported cases of near-death experiences, there have been some people who went through the experience while being connected to an EEG machine. And all throughout, there were no signs of any brain activity. They were considered brain dead during that time. So I, I just want to make that note. And I think that it also, it to a certain extent, it, it 
even makes my initial question even more shocking, if you think about it. I have a lot more to say on it. I'm going to continue this uh, next week, but I love, as we're slowly coming to a close, I love any questions, any uh, comments, uh, and of course, some some nice uh, golden nuggets. Questions first? Okay, no questions. I see Jill. Jill, let's start with your golden nugget. And then you can pass it on to whoever. Oh, gosh. To see how golden this is. It's just, it, this is an amazingly fascinating topic. And um, I've been watching this this woman who calls herself Hospice Nurse Julie. And she posts about, this isn't near death. These are usually the dying process. But she, the, the similarities, I think, she talks about it as what she observes and experiences that it's a really beautiful process that unless there's some bizarre interventions it's it's really beautiful and peaceful and you know people go in and out so there's observations of that seem like what we talk about with near death experiences with connecting with loved ones that have gone before us and I I find it really heartwarming and, you know, hopefully that is an experience that, well, we all will get to experience the death experience, but uh, that there is this peace around it. And um, I know as we believe in, um, you know, life is most important, but it will come to an end. So to just uh, not be afraid. I think that's 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 a big one for me, and I'll pass it on to Alessandra. And I've got to I've got to run, but thank you. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Jill. Uh, sorry, no, because I'm on a Zoom call as well. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> sorry, I'm in a cab. I'm 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 flying to Atlanta in a, a couple of hours. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So my question that I had in the middle of the night, Rabbi, was if, you know, we, we, we know that death is not, thank you, thank you, bye, death is not the end of life because we, we continue on. So why is that, that if someone is attached to a machine, we still want to keep them going in this material life, whereas we know that it's only, I don't want to use the word bliss on the other side, but that they really move on to a continuation that the life is not finished. That it woke me up at 2 a.m., sorry. I get to ask the question. I have to, I have to tell you a joke. Sorry. <laughs> as serious as this question, I have to tell you a joke. So... Harry and Bertha, after 120 years, finally make it up to heaven. And Harry finds out that heaven is just filled with the most sweetest sugar, desserts, the best, best, best foods that he's ever seen in his life. And he turns to Bertha and he says, why were you making me go on all these diets and do all these things? We could have been here 10 years ago. Okay. So that doesn't answer my question. <laughs> it doesn't answer your question. It's it's a very what what you're asking is is a very important question, and the answer is is that we don't know of quality of life. We know of life, and there's another element that we didn't speak about in this conversation, and that is what the soul can do, whether or not it's hooked up to a machine during this lifetime, is worth myriads of what the soul can do in the next world. And because I'm a rabbi and I've had the unique experiences of, of, of being able to be part of people's lives during these moments, I, I can just tell you anecdotally, it, it's unbelievable. And, and we in Judaism, we don't believe in quality of life. The person is alive, whether it's by machine or not machine, 
there's a there's a there's a value of them being in this world, and there's a reason why that person needs to be in this world. Which is why, according to Jewish law, you could have a DNR, but once the resuscitation has happened and the person is put in a machine, that's considered life, and they cannot be that cannot be manipulated with. But I still can ask not to be resuscitated. Yes, you can. Okay. Yes. Thank you. That was my 30 second or less answer. You want to pass it along? Thank you. Yes, yes. And I have to say goodbye because I really need to check in. And I will pass it on to Edwin. I don't know, everyone is not here uh, or doesn't have anything to say. Pass it to Cheryl. I see you, Cheryl. Hi, welcome back. Um, it's hard to absorb all this after having a month vacation of this heavy duty. When we first started this class, I found it very comforting. You talked about the souls and the afterlife <clears throat> and I found death very comforting because there is no such thing as death. And we keep going and now we get into this heavy duty stuff. So uh, my takeaway today really had to do with something you said earlier with the minor seizures and bringing up the forgotten memories. And I'm thinking, this is just my thing. Could I ask to do that medically? <clears throat> to bring on these little seizures, to bring back the little memory lapses, you know, that I missed. Um, I don't know if there was a way that I would even want to in this lifetime or just have to wait until that happens on its own. So that was my little takeaway and thought. So thank you, welcome back. And I am going to pass this to Henrietta. Is that your name or how, how to pronounce it? You're muted. It's Harriet. It's the English name with a French spelling. That's what happens when you grow up in Quebec. Um, <laughs> um, what struck me is when my father-in-law, Vasholam, was at end stage. And he was in and out of, I'm not saying a coma, but he long periods of sleep. And then he'd wake up. Um, and of course, we were there. and. He, he spoke of, of things that had happened in his life uh, that we never knew. It was so many revelations about uh, what happened from when he was a kid and um, things with my mother-in-law and his brothers and sisters and his parents and great revelations. And uh, a couple of days later, he passed. And um, my husband and I were very grateful that he shared those memories with us because we really got a, an insight into his, his uh, being um, that we never had before. And we, had he not shared them, they would, these memories would have been lost. So, And there was no stimulation or anything. He was just a natural state. So uh, when the rabbi was talking about putting the electrodes and whatever, I thought, well, I'm wondering if it doesn't sometimes, like in this instance, occur naturally. You don't need the electronic stimulus, simulators, that it could just be someone who's clinging on to corporeal life and knowing the end is near and trying to recall certain memories. That's my takeaway. Thank you, Harriet. That's really, really good. And welcome. Welcome to our class. Thank you. you what can I say? You know, I grew up in NDG, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, have you. You, want, you want to pass it along to someone? Yeah, let's, let's try Rima. She looks interested, so. Hi, everybody. Um very interesting class thank you as always um my takeaway is um 
about meditation. So everybody is, uh, I mean, we all hear about it and each person can reach uh, different levels of meditation. But uh, I like, Rabbi, how you said that, um, how do you know whether this was spiritual experience or not? Uh, how you define whether this is just something you tell yes, or this is a true, you know, you reach something like untouchable. So, and I, I like how you said that um, this has to be defined by each person individually, because each person is the one who experiences that. So nobody else can really um, understand how that feels. So I like that. So that would be my nugget for today. Thank you. Thank you, Rima. Thank you and welcome. We're happy, happy to have you. Thank you. You want to pass it on? How do I do that? Just, uh, and there's a uh, Jamil, Ilana, Kelsey hasn't, Chava hasn't had a chance, Julian, uh, any of them, Fami. Kelsey, so, okay, so. You can just say someone's name. Thank you, Rima. Oh, you say okay. Kelsey? I thought you, you have to do something. Okay. No, don't have to do anything. Hi, Kelsey. <laughs> Hi, thank you. It's good to see everyone here and have such a big class today. And it's good to see you, Rabbi. It has been so long. Um, this class kind of made me think of, you know, the rabbi says, um, how you say I love ice cream is different from how you love your grandma and language just doesn't really do, uh, or the English language does not do a good job of encompassing that. Um, and drawing from the Kabbalah of meditation after that class, I think, that really brought in the spirituality uh, even more into my life. And so everything is more and more a spiritual experience for me. And everything is more infinitely connected all the time, e even though I'm still physically limited. And I realize that I am more spiritually aware and spiritually connected to everything around me, if that makes sense. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you, Kelsey. It's good to be back. Thank you. Um, Hava. Thanks, Kelsey. Hi, everybody. Um, today, I was struck by the, the kind of parallel, the, the correlation of this place of memories and, and then the, the process of the the cleansing of the soul that we've talked about. I think that's really interesting. And then um, the other thought I had was uh, if these spiritual experiences <clears throat> that we might have aren't just kind of uh, turning down the volume to zero of this noise that that we create for ourselves in our sensory perceptions and our and our thoughts. So that's my. Those are my thoughts today. And uh, Jamil, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Would you like to share? That was perfect. Thank you. I was actually uh, excited to share one more, one more last story. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I wanted to add, because my, my main um, attraction or interest towards Judaism, because uh, I do come from a Christian background, Christian family, uh, was the whole action and presence of the physical world uh, compared to other religions where it's mostly based on the spiritual realm, which most of us don't have access to. Uh, so just to add uh, on basically what you mentioned, as long as you take a bit of positive and then bring yourself back to the present and try to do as much good and as much uh, great actions so we can make this experience a better uh, a better school for everybody that goes through uh, this this world or this experience so i don't know if i if, if i've uh, if i've passed my thoughts uh, yeah. on, on oh, that's this great thoughts thank you jamil thank you Th thanks to you 
you want to you want to pass it on we have alana we have uh uh fami and i think julian are left so whoever hasn't talked yet so it would be uh alana why don't we go with you let's go thank you okay thank you um okay i i don't know if that i'm on the same page as maybe a lot of the people um and you know alessandra said you know death is not the end of life but i i can't really agree with that um i think death is the end of life on on this earth and it's our job to kind of make the best of it and be the best people we can be and um but you know to me like the people that came before us you know, they're, they're dead. You know, I don't think that there's going to be a resurrection. We're not going to meet again. But, you know, as long as we remember them, we keep them in our hearts. Um, I think that's the only way that, that they really do kind of stay alive and that they're, they're with us. We don't forget about them. You know, we name our children after people we, we love and, care about um anyway uh thank you that's it thank you yeah but maybe julian oh, julian has a question there's a statement one day for you lord is like a thousand years from which people interpret heaven and have something parallel to our time i've heard that statement and i'm going to go back to what I said before is that we're looking at it from our perspective. Our perspective is limited to time and space. God's perspective, other worlds expect perspectives are not limited to time and space. And I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes in for a lot of people. But thank you, Julian. And let's go to uh, Fami. We'll end with you. Hi there, Abai. Welcome back. So, uh, so me, what, what strikes me, uh, probably, if we, if we <clears throat> all this like uh, light uh, experiences and uh, is like the correlation with uh, with the, what we heard now and with the custom, let's say, of lighting a candle for dead people to you 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 you. <clears throat> Light is very, it's a very, uh, it's very mystical material. You know, we don't know what it is. Is it a, is it a wave? We don't know. Is it like a par Is it a particle? Is it a wave? We don't, we don't know. Is it like a dual part? Uh, light have no have no time associated with it. So as fast. So what Einstein said is like, when you go as fast uh, as uh, the speed of light, time stops. Mm. So it's it's so it have no it's like it's like something which is boundless in time, and 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 and, and me when I light a when we light a candle, let's say to help somebody elevate. First of all, when we light a candle, the lights is is up, it's not down. So which is like all this symbolism. Why? You could have made like when you light 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 a candle, the candle the the the, the light don't I mean the the flame don't go up. It can go down, but it goes up. So it's it's indicative of uh, of uh, I mean uh, so that's why and I agree that light is is uh, uh, light. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, godly characteristics. We, we don't understand it anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and thank you. Thank you so much, Fami. And thank you, everyone, for being here today. It's been an absolute honor to be back. And I'm looking forward uh, to uh, continuing this conversation next week at 9 o'clock. Same time, same channel. So for those of you who are leaving uh, and not joining us for Tomwood, uh, I'm good. We're going to go on to Talmud now. If you want to join us for Talmud, you're welcome.